This is Paul Reese speaking from the balcony behind you. Sorry about that. Just a slight change in the program this morning. We are fortunate to have Christine Van Ardsdale playing harp. This was a little of a last minute happening. Uh, so the things that she's playing are not in a bulletin, but she is playing Gordon Young. So that was an amazing happenstance. She is also playing some Brahms. Um, so please delight, worship, pray, and reflect as we have harp for Prelude this morning.
Good morning and welcome to St. Michael's Church. Those of you here in the sanctuary, those of you online joining us around the world. This morning we celebrate through morning prayer, that one Sunday of the month where we don't have Eucharist, but instead look at our mission impact around the world on this morning prayer Sunday. The Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. You shall know that the Lord is in the midst of his people. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, seated or kneeling, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace, reflecting silently on those you have hurt and those who have hurt you as we pray in confession. Praying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Please stand as we sing together. Open our lips. 
O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, us. Praise the Lord. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The Lord be with you. Remaining standing, let us pray. O merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the... The lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, beginning at, with verse 1. Please follow along with me in your pew Bibles on page 10. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to him to, as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all of these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land. The word of the Lord. Please stand as we pray Psalm 105 responsively by whole verse. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the world. Even the covenant he made with Abraham and the oath that he swore to Isaac. Which he appointed to Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting testament. Saying to you I will give the land of Canaan to be the portion of your inheritance. Glory, Glory to the Father, Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit. Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and ever shall be, world, world without end. Amen. Amen.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Would you please read in your Bibles on page 832 as we read Matthew chapter 26, beginning at the 26th verse. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Would you please pray with me? Jesus, I pray that you would step off the pages of Scripture this morning such that we would know you more fully and hear you more clearly and trust you with everything we have. In your holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I want to tell you something. I tithe. Now, some people may think, why in the world are you telling such a private detail it's not that it's that private to me. It seems to be a, just a normal thing to me. It's something I grew up with and have always realized that it's part of what you just do, right? Tithing, after all, is the training wheels of generosity. And so if my salary is $100,000 a year, which it has been, I give 10% to the church. If my salary is $18,000, which it has been, I give 10% to the church. It's the training wheels. It's the least that I can do. I'm reminded of a wonderful story from Dr. Peter Marshall, who was the former chair, chaplain to the United States Senate. And he had a man who had a concern about tithing. The man came to Dr. Marshall and said, I have a problem. I've been tithing for some time. It wasn't so bad when I was making $20,000 a year. I could afford to give $2,000. But you see, now I'm making $500,000 a year, and there's just no way I can afford to give $50,000. Dr. Marshall, reflecting on this man's wealth and his dilemma, was empathetic, and he said, yes, sir, I see that you have a problem. I think we ought to pray about it. Is that all right? And so Dr. Marshall put his hand on the man's shoulder and boldly prayed with authority, dear Lord, this man has a problem, and I pray that you will help him. Lord, reduce his salary back to the place where he can afford the tithe. (laughs) Yes, I tithe, but I want to tell you something else. God doesn't need your money. Let me double down on that. God doesn't want your money. Wait, I can hear it now. We need to fill out the pledge cards. Yes, but... Hold on, we budget off those pledge cards. Yes, but... But didn't Father Al say that we should tithe last week? Yes. But God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. You see, money is easy. Heart, well, that's hard. Abram has just been through a great battle, and at the end of it, he tithes in response, which is really interesting. He tithes to Melchizedek, one of the kings that he just rescued, and refuses money from the king of Sodom, another one that he has just rescued. What's going on there is interesting because Melchizedek is a man who worships. And so the response to victory at battle was to worship God. King Sodom was a man of power, and so his response to battle was a power play. Adam joins Melchizedek in worship, and tithing is his act of worship. God wants your heart. God doesn't want your money. Money is just an outward expression of your inward beliefs. And that's where we find Abraham today. He's struggling with his inward beliefs. God promised to make Abraham into a great nation, but it's been 10 years. And Abraham's afraid. And God's response to Abraham, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be great. But you see, Abraham doesn't want a typical reward. Money doesn't motivate motivate him. He tithes. Power doesn't motivate him. He turns that down. What motivates Abraham is security in God. What motivates Abraham is knowing that God will come through. And well, he's not quite sure yet. Can God be trusted? 
So here's the sermon. Here is all of it. Fear not. God is your shield because, number one, of who he is, number two, what he's done, number three, what he does or what he will do. So take out your Bible or your phone or your app or whatever you may have and look to um, Genesis chapter 15 and follow along there with me, if you will. Genesis chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Now, Abraham is a pagan, and it's important for us. We heard last week about paganism, but it's important to understand what a pagan is. A pagan is someone who does great things for God, hoping that God will do good things for them. It kind of works this way. My dad's dog, Bailey, is a pagan. You see, the food is put out for Bailey all the time. It's available to her anytime she'd like to eat, but she's a pagan. She's weird. She thinks she has to work to get the food. She literally will look at the food, look at dad, look at the food, look at dad, and she won't eat until dad takes her outside, tosses the frisbee, has her go look for squirrels, do a perimeter check, and it doesn't matter how long it takes. As long as she goes outside, she can come back in, and immediately she starts to eat. She's doing good things for dad, hoping that dad will do good things for her. This is the difference between Christianity and all other religions. Religious people do good things for God. Christians and Abraham see God doing good things for them, and their response is a heart of love and worship. That's what discipleship's all about. Mark 1.17, my favorite definition of discipleship, says, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. There's this progress that moves from being lost to being found, from being found to being freed to form to fulfilling the great commission, what you have in, God has in mind for you. And that's the path that Abraham is taking. He was lost out there in the wilderness and God found him and freed him from these kings and was bringing him into formation into one who can trust God. God's promise to be Abraham's shield, his protection, and his reward, his legacy is true, and Abram believes him, but not at first. You see, he's afraid. At this point, Abram simply has obeyed, but now he has some questions. He's afraid that God won't live up to his promise. He says, for I continue childless. He'd been promised this heir. And how can you trust God when the circumstances seem to indicate the opposite? You've been there, haven't you? God has told you this is going to happen or that's going to happen. You're like, I'm not seeing it. It's just not, not what I'm experiencing, Lord. I'm having trouble and I need some help. For Abram, his, lot, his nephew Lot, he's off in Sodom outside the promise. Eliezer's an adopted servant, a backup plan at best. This is prudence, but not faith. And so Abram's frustrated. He's disappointed. And I want you to know that's not disobedient. It's okay to be disappointed. That's a feeling. It's what you do with that feeling that matters. And what you should do is exactly what Abram did. He went to the source. He goes to God. He says, God, I got a problem. I don't know. Can I trust you? Abram gets an answer from God. God brings him out in the middle of the night and he said, look towards the heaven and number the stars. So shall your offspring be. And Abram's response is, he believes the Lord and it's counted to him as righteousness. God is promising to do something that is impossible and he's backing it up by saying, I'm the one that you worshiped in the last chapter. Look it up. I'm the one that you worship, that you raised your hands to. I'm the one who created the heavens and the earth. You can trust me. I got a good resume. You can trust that I'm going to be there for you. And Abram believes God. Friends, I want you to know that it's not the level of your faith, but the object of your faith that matters. 
You see, the level of your faith says you need to sing louder and praise harder and you need to raise your hands, jump and shout and, and, and make it loud, right? Or, well, wait a minute, this is Michael's church. We need to rethink that. You need to sit in the beauty of holiness and enjoy the Lord. And whatever, whatever it is, the reality is, is that it's not the level of your faith, it's the object of your faith that matters. And Abram says, I can't trust me, I can trust God though. And so I'm going to keep believing against hope. Romans 4 says that in hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. Abraham's being formed, discipled, to follow. That's what tithing does, that's what moving out in ministry does. It's trusting God to be your reward. The question is, can God be trusted? And the answer is, fear not. God is your shield because of, number one, who he is. Number two, what he's done. Follow along in your Bibles. Let's look at verse 7. And God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out, of the, out from the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Abram's future is dependent on faith in God, in his history, what he's done, and in his promise. He says, I'm the Lord, I've already delivered you and I'm going to keep delivering you. God's brought him this far, and he can trust in hope that the future is going to be good, but the timing's off. You see, for Abraham, he's looking and he's saying, God, it's been 10 years, and I don't know about you, I'm, I'm, I'm 49 years old. In just a few months, I turn 50, and all of a sudden, I'm beginning to think, whoa, death is close. Life is taking a different perspective at some levels. When you look at time, 10 years is a long time. But God's timeline is a whole lot different. He's looking at 400 years and he's saying, listen, I'm not just going to give you an heir. I'm going to make the heir a people and I'm going to make the people a nation and I'm going to bring them through tragedy to health and holiness and, and I'm going to bring them into a land and I'm going to bring the promise. And so he's not looking at the 10 years that Abraham's concerned about, he's saying, I got this all the way through to the end. I'm going to take care of the whole thing. And you can trust me, not just with 10 years for your life, but with 400 and more years for the generations. But it's going to be a winding journey. God's there, and he will bring judgment on those who hurt and harm his people, but it's going to take some time. Michael Irving, the former wide receiver of the Dallas Cowboys, one year he signed a guaranteed contract for $22 million. $22 million, guaranteed. You don't have to show up to work the next day. You got it. $22 million. That's a good deal, right? And they asked him, how would you like to receive the money? Would you like to receive it in one lump sum or over time? And he said, uh, one sounds good. And so sure enough, he got done with the press conference, went back to his locker room, and there on the chair in front of his locker was a check signed by Jerry Jones for $22 million. The question is, did he have $22 million? To answer that question, you need to go to a Scrooge McDuck. You know that great cartoon character, right? You know, he dives into his money and he's swimming and doing the backstroke through the gold and all that kind of stuff. It, Scrooge McDuck had millions of dollars, did Michael Irving? And the answer is no, he had a promise. It was a good promise. It was signed by somebody who could follow through on the promise, but he had a promise. Friends, Christian people are waiting people. We have a promise, signed, sealed, and yet to be delivered. But I want you to know the Lord's not slow in fulfilling his promise. That's what Saint, Second Peter says. He's patient. He's patient. But the day will come. You can trust that. Can God be trusted? Fear not. God is your shield because, number one, who he is. Number two, what he's done. And number three, 
what he does or what he will do. Look back in your Bibles. Look at uh, verse 8. But Abram said, O Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He's, he's not questioning God at this point. He's questioning himself. Do I have what it takes to keep the contract? Now, I know that you do. I'm going to trust that you, the creator of the moon and the stars and the heavens and the cosmos, that you've got it, but I'm worrying about me. Do I have what it takes? Verse 9, God said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, a pigeon. And he brought all those things, cut them in half, and laid each half over and against the other. Verse 12, and the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these two pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. The Lord's covenant is based on his work, not ours. How do I know? How do I know that I have what it takes to keep it going? God does something very interesting. He starts a contract ceremony. Now, I know about contracts. We just sold our house. And with the selling of our house, praise God, hallelujah, there was a lot of paperwork and a lot of signing on the dotted lines. Because you know what you have to do for a contract. To do a contract, you have to get out paper and you have to sign on the dotted line. That's how I know that you're going to keep your part of the bargain and I'm going to keep my part of the bargain. And if you don't keep your part and I don't keep my part, there are some friends called lawyers that are going to get involved. And they're going to talk to each other and make sure that we follow what we signed, right? That's how we do contracts. But how do you do a contract in an oral society? You act it out. And what they were doing in that time was that if I made a contract with you, I would say, um, if, if we make a contract, we're going to split some animals, and we're going to say, if I keep my part of the bargain and you keep my, your part, all's good. But if we don't keep it, pieces. You're going to be like that animal if you don't keep your side, and I'm going to be like that animal if I don't keep my side. It's a pretty vivid way of making clear that the contract was serious. It also might take care of some of a few lawyers' jobs if we did it like that, if we took it that seriously. What's interesting, though, is who could enter contracts? All of you and I could enter a contract, and that would be normal. But if I was a king, and I'm not, obviously, but if I was a king... You could enter into a contract with me, but you're the only one that's held to the contract terms. You see, in the ancient Near East, a king was granting you a favor by letting you enter into a contract. But it was on you. If you don't live up to your side of the contract, pieces. If I don't live up to my side of the contract, well, you know, I'm the king. Kind of a different way of looking at things. So what's going on in this? Read it again. Look at it. It says a deep sleep fell on Abram. It says a great darkness fell, a smoking fire pot, a flaming torch. It's strange, but all you need to ask is who's going through the contract? Who's the one making the contract? The smoking fire pot and the flaming torch is the symbol of God, kind of like the pillar of fire and cloud in the book of Exodus. It's the presence of God that's going through. What's Abram doing while this is happening? Did you catch it? What's Abram doing? He's sleeping. He's asleep. A God-induced, comfortable, glorious sleep number set to the right number kind of sleep. He's good. He's resting. Because God is saying, this is my covenant. I will do it. Can God be trusted? Fear not. God is your shield because of, number one, who he is, number two, what he's done, and number three, what he does. So as we begin to end this sermon, there are three questions I always like to ask. What is it we need to do? Who do we need to share this with? And what's the good news here? So let's take the first one. What do we need to do? We need to tithe. Those are the training wheels. But the real issue is we need to trust God. He's made promises with you. Some of you remember baptizing your child back there in that baptismal font. You made promises and your child may be wandering far away. And God is saying, I got the kid. The promise was made in my name, not yours. I'll be there. 
Some of you have made prayers in this place and said, God, I will follow you into this crazy path you've given me. And the circumstances are a little bit rocky. And God is telling you this morning, listen, I made the promise. I drew you in. Just keep walking. Bring your questions. Trust him. Bring your life. Trust him. Move out in faith. Get going. Second question, who do I need to share this with? I don't know. Do you have any friends that are feeling cornered? Maybe they say something like, I feel like God's abandoned me. Abraham probably felt like that. But where does he go? He goes to God. If you have a friend that's just struggling with their faith, just encourage them to go. Look up to the stars and say, you, God, who made all of this, help me. Now, that's good advice, isn't it? Should you tithe? Yes. Should you trust God with everything? Yes. But what if you're tired? It's been a long time. You've been waiting, and you just don't feel like you have the strength anymore. What's the good news for you? Not just the good advice. What's the good news in here? The good news is that we can trust God because of what he's already done in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You see, what was the promise that was made? I will be your shield and you will get a great reward. You will get a great reward. We talk about that all the time. That great reward is the great bliss that we will have when we die. And if you're holding on to Jesus rather than holding on to this life, heaven is your great reward. But here's the cool thing. He says, I will be your shield. What's that all about? Well, that's all about, friends, the great news that you're not going to live up to the covenant. You're not. I know you're going to try. I know you're going to work hard at it. And you're going to try to live the best Christian life that you can. But the reality is, is that you're going to fail sometimes. And I fail lots of times. We are broken, horrible, no good, very bad sinners. And we're really good at that. We break the promise, but he never does. And because he never does, Jesus lived a life that you and I could never live so that he could be the shield on the cross. You see, that night before he was betrayed, while the disciples slept, he went out, was taken to the cross so that he could be split apart on the cross. And so that the wrath that you and I deserve for being the rotten, horrible, no good, very bad sinners that we are doesn't come on us. Instead, it is diverted to Jesus. And he becomes our shield, the one who covers us. And that darkness that Abram saw, and that fire comes upon Jesus when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, it was God who was cut off, cut to pieces. He died so that you and I won't. The cost was put on him. The promise was made good because of Jesus. Galatians says it this way, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that's you and me, through Jesus Christ. Fear not. Fear not, Abram. Fear not, Abram's children. God is your shield. Your reward shall be great. Not because of what you're doing, but because of what he's done. Would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, meet us. Wherever we're at, we've heard your promise. We see our failures. Help us to look and see Jesus, who is our shield, and bring us to our reward. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Let us now proclaim our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Seated or kneeling, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Heavenly Father, without your grace, it is impossible to keep the covenant. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who awakens us to a covenant living. May your covenant living transform our hearts, minds, families, jobs, and even the way we use our money. Thank you for being the new covenant shed for us, that we would be a transformed people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for God's people throughout the world, for Chip, our bishop-elect, for Marsha, our bishop, for Foley, archbishop of the Anglican Church of North America, the congregation of St. Michael's Church, and for all mission partners, both local and abroad. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joe, our president, Henry, our governor, and John, our mayor, and for all who serve in law enforcement and the armed forces, that we would be one nation under God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our mission at St. Michael's Church of transforming every heart and home, the holy city, the hurting coast, and the hungering world through Jesus Christ with our mission partners, both here and abroad. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all the blessings of this life, especially for the gift of tithing, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all of those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, we also lift up those who have come to us for your prayers of healing, especially for Mary Chapman, Viola Smalls, Ina Zadig, George Crawford, Vicki Proctor, Alec Dickinson, Hayden Lee, Roger Sample, Jenny Good, Celia Gaddy, Gray Cabanis, Annie Howard, Howard Gadson, Karen Regan, Charlotte Brooks, Steve Oust, Mass Priester, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as together we give thanksgiving to God. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. 
We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you and with your spirit. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Michael's Church. Please be seated. Again, those of you here in the sanctuary, those of you online, we welcome you uh, to the family of St. Michael's. And if this is your first time or you're new today, please fill out that little blue Connect card in front of you so that we can know you by name and pray for you as well. We also use that blue card for existing uh, members of the St. Michael's family uh, for you to tell us if there's any new information in your life uh, a new ministry or something that you're contemplating in your life, that is our communication card. We also hope that each one of you is getting our weekly newsletter by email because that uh, is really all the news every week that goes out into your computer and we want to make sure that the family gets all the news. And so please put that email on that blue card as well if you're not getting uh, the family e-blast every week and you can put that blue card in the offertory place. Today, after this service, uh, there is prayer ministry, and so if you've come with a burden on your heart or a need uh, in your life, please know there are trained people to pray with you right after this service. This coming Wednesday night, the founder of the Bible Journey Curriculum will be here in person. Dr. Tim Laniak uh, will be teaching here on Wednesday night as part of our Fear Not series. And Tim uh, lives up in Charlotte. He is a professor at Gordon-Conwell and will be teaching on biblical wisdom. Uh, and so that's Wednesday night. Uh, so at 5.30, we have worship, 6 o'clock dinner, no need to make dinner. And then we launch into all of our classes at 6.30. Fear not, uh, looking at wisdom is one of those classes. Then next Sunday, we will have a farewell gathering for the Reverend David Booman and his family in the Kinlaw Room at 10 a.m. The Boomans are on their way to the Church of the Holy Comforter in Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, and so next Sunday will be their last day. And so gather with us as we celebrate their ministry at 10 o'clock. Sunday school is suspended for that week. And uh, we will gather with them in the Kinlaw Room. But this is Mission Sunday where we look at the impact of the St. Michael's Church family locally and around the world. And today we welcome from our mission task force, Park Doherty, to tell us about life on the mission field from St. Michael's Church. Good morning. Good morning. As you all know, our full report is, came to you last Thursday in an e-blast from Trish. And I highly recommend you, you read these blasts because they have photographs, links to videos uh, that are very com compelling, so I hope that you will uh, go back and look at what Trish sent you on Thursday. Uh, the senior warden suggested that I deliver these highlights as a Gregorian chant, which um, I just think it's a, t a terribly subversive idea and a terrible idea all the way. Uh, the Mission Task Force Holy City Committee has recently added two new mission partners, uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at the College of Charleston through a grant to purchase Bible study supplies and programming. Will Kendrick is the area 
representative, and he is doing a fantastic job. He reports that they have more than 100 students participating in small group Bible studies throughout nine different groups. These are College of Charleston students. Um, Star Gospel Mission has been a mission partner in the past, and we're pleased to have the opportunity to have a partnership with them again. You'll certainly hear more about them because their new board chair is St. Michaelite David Engel. Uh, Herding Coast News, new wineskins is offering an early bird discount registration for their mission conference, which is set to begin on September 22nd of next year at the Ridgecrest Conference Center in North Carolina. Our Gene and Johnny Corbett are all signed up and are asking all of us to consider joining them. Uh, please see the, the e-blast that I mentioned for a link to register. Hungering World News. The Anglican Relief and Development Fund, or ARDF, uh, recently sent three of their leaders to, to meet with the Mission Task Force. Uh, they're another new partner of ours. Um, and what they've been doing, they've been doubling our contributions. And they've been identifying opportunities to support faithful Christians. Last month, for example, ARDF matched a $10,000 gift by St. Michael's parishioner to add a second floor to a school in India. They also matched a $2,000 contribution to Water Mission's disaster response to the earthquake and devastating hurricane that struck Haiti. And they matched $3,000 to support safe passage for Americans and Afghans from Afghanistan. Uh, finally, please remember to complete your mission pledge so that St. Michaelites may continue to be blessed, to be a blessing unto others. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And, uh, that mission begins in the home. And so once a month on this particular Sunday, uh, we always pray for those celebrating birthdays and wedding anniversaries. In the month of October, would you please stand so that we can pray for you? And the rest of us, if we could extend a hand in blessing to pray for our brothers and sisters. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Watch over your sons and daughters as their days increase. Bless and guide them at every step. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their heart may your peace, which passes all understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the same way, we want to bless and pray for those who have wedding anniversaries this month. If you are in the sanctuary or online, if you could stand and let us know that you have an anniversary. If you would, look around and see those people and uh, put your hands towards them and let's pray. Oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send your blessing upon these, your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 You can be seated. During our sermon, Father Greg spoke about covenant living, a way to transform our hearts, our minds, our families, our jobs, even the way we use our money. And our brother and chair of the Stewardship Task Force, Lee Michael, is here to share with us how covenant living has changed his life. Good morning. Good morning. And what a beautiful morning God has created for us here in Charleston. Amen. Amen. Following up on Greg's excellent message, I'd like to share that God's covenant emboldens me to tithe to the body of Christ and to give to St. Michael's Church. This covenant is constantly revealed to me through the people God brings into my life. They teach me and remind me of the good news of the gospel and how to live blessed. 
God introduced me to one of these people earlier this month. I was on a business Zoom call, and on that call I met Kevin. Kevin is an entrepreneur who lives in the state of Texas. He makes a lot of money, and he loses a lot of money. Eventually, our group meeting turned into a discussion about the subject of faith. And you always know that when you go into that subject, the conversation reaches a sweeter and higher level, especially when you have Christians on the call. Kevin shared that he and his wife just made another large pledge to their church, which he called the Body of Christ here on Earth. Its stewardship sees it everywhere, not just here at St. Michael's. Kevin wasn't boasting, but said they do it as a testament to their faith and to teach and encourage other Christians to invest in heaven. We all agreed on the call, and I think we can all agree here in the sanctuary and online that our life here is transitory. We're just passing through. We may have weeks, months, or years, but this is not our eternal home. Kevin said he and his wife are committed Matthew 6, 19 through 20 Christians. That verse is on page 10 of your bulletin, but let me read it to you. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth nor dust corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. By giving to my church, which is the body of Christ, reiterated Kevin, my wife and I are laying up our treasures and investing in heaven. So I ask all of you in this sanctuary and online, three questions I ask myself every day when I get up and am blessed with another day. Number one, where do my or your blessings come from? And by blessings, I mean spiritual, emotional, physical, and material. Number two, where is your heart? Billy Graham used to say, give me five minutes with a person's checkbook, and I will tell you where their heart is. And number three, where will you spend eternity? Are you laying up your treasures there? Are you pledging your financial resources to St. Michael's Church? Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Trust in God, and to God be the glory. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, many of you know that right now during this month, we start to plan our budget for 2022, and your giving card helps us plan our budget. So I need your help. Would you please consider filling one of these out? I need you to do that so we can adequately plan. In Luke 14, Jesus tells us to count the cost. It's an important teaching about thinking and planning ahead what it means to follow him. It's a call for all of us in ministry to see that achieving success at the end of the journey, well, it really begins at the beginning of the journey. So help us in that first step into next year by filling out and returning your 2022 giving card. And these cards are in your pew. There's also one, Lee referenced page 10 of your bulletin. So you'll see a giving card there. You can fill that out. You can mail it back to us. You can take this home, mail it back. But for your convenience, today, as you leave the church, there is a return giving box uh, in the narthex. So as you depart, take time to fill this out. As you depart, you can stick it in the box on your way out. Um, for those of you that are online, mailing, or even the phone, you can call us and give your online amount. Thank you for helping us plan next year. Now, my friends, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, 
an offering and sacrifice to God. Holy Trinity make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth into the world to transform hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah.